Chinese entrepreneurs in the 1970s, as well as refugees from Vietnam and Cambodia, transformed an area on the city's north side by opening restaurants, bakeries, pharmacies, and social service agencies. Today we're discussing Chicago's Little Saigon. I'm Tommy Henry, and this is the Chicago History Podcast. Alan Kim. I am an architectural historian and I am a professor at the University of Toronto. That's Erica Allen Kim, author of Building Little Saigon, recently released from the University of Texas Press. Alan Kim traveled to 10 Little Saigons in the United States, including the one here in Chicago, to visit archives, buildings, and public art, and to converse with developers, community planners, artists, business owners, and Vietnam veterans. We'll hear more from Alan Kim in a moment. A little background on the area for those of you unfamiliar with it. The West Argyle Street Historic District is a 41-acre area that has origins stretching back to the 1880s when it was developed as a suburb of Chicago called Argyle Park. In 1889, that area was annexed to Chicago, and when the Northwestern Elevated Railroad was extended north from Wilson Avenue in 1908, those wishing to live along Lake Michigan had new options. The name Uptown, according to Mark Guarino in his excellent book Country and Midwestern, wasn't formally chosen until the early 1920s. Before that, the area was called Wilson Avenue District. In 1921, a local retailer who felt Wilson Avenue District did not adequately describe the excitement of the surroundings pushed for it to be called Uptown. The 1920s and the 1930s saw Uptown thrive with magnificent movie palaces, upscale department stores, dance halls, beachside hotels, jazz clubs, and restaurants drawing Chicagoans to this busy neighborhood buzzing with nightlife. Then, The Great Depression hit, and things began to change in Uptown. After the end of the Second World War, an increased demand for manufacturing brought people from the South and the Appalachian region to Chicago in search of employment. It is estimated that between 1940 and 1970, roughly 3.2 million Appalachian and Southern migrants settled in Chicago and elsewhere in the Midwest. These recent arrivals to the city looking to connect with those from their former towns and cities found them in Uptown, which had started losing its earlier population as longtime Uptown residents moved to the suburbs. Desperate for work and a place to live, these newcomers to Chicago often fell prey to unscrupulous landlords and employment agencies. While many Appalachian and Southern migrants settled in other Chicago neighborhoods, The Appalachian population in Uptown had the highest density and was the poorest in the city. While many who arrived initially found manufacturing jobs, as those jobs disappeared, unemployment in Uptown spiked. Disinvestment in the area was prevalent. The 1960s and 1970s saw little improvement in Uptown. Along Argyle Street, on a mere three-block stretch between Broadway and Sheridan, there were reportedly 14 taverns and a topless bar called the Hourglass. Numerous vices, including prostitution and drugs, were widespread. When Chicago's construction of the Metropolitan Correctional Center at Clark and Van Buren began in 1971 and forced what was left of Chicago's original Chinatown out, Local restaurateur Jimmy Wong had a vision for a new Chinatown located to the north of the larger Chinatown nestled south of the Loop. Although hard to believe now, fans of Asian culture and dining didn't always head to Argyle Street. When Frank Ang opened King's Restaurant at 1109 West Argyle Street in 1972, he was reportedly the first Chinese restaurateur on the street. 
By 1974, Jimmy Wong and other investors bought as much as 80% of the three-block stretch on Argyle. Their vision for the street included a mall with pagodas, with trees and reflecting ponds to replace the empty storefronts. In a 1974 interview, Wong said, quote, We want every part of it to be beautiful even the alleys. With imagination and hard work, we can give the new Chinatown an atmosphere and elements of fantasy that may someday make it one of Chicago's biggest drawing cards. Unfortunately, Wong broke his hip a year later and was forced to retire. Even without his guidance, the area began to find new life. Asian immigrants began to fill formerly empty apartments and once shuttered storefronts reopened. Following the 1975 fall of Saigon, Vietnamese and Cambodian immigrants fleeing communism came to Chicago, settling in the uptown area near Argyle Street. Soon, Vietnamese residents outnumbered Chinese in New Chinatown, and the area began to reflect a different name, Little Saigon. In 1979, local businessman Charlie Sue picked up where Jimmy Wong left off and formed the Asian American Small Business Association. Determined to spur commercial development, Sue worked tirelessly convincing the Chicago Transit Authority into a $250,000 renovation for the Argyle Street Red Line stop in 1979 that included a paint job with vivid red and green enamels, colors symbolizing prosperity, and longevity. He secured funds from Mayor Jane Byrne to fix the neighborhood sidewalks, and then from Mayor Harold Washington, monies to repair building facades. Soon, the graffiti was gone, replaced with eye-catching signs and a renewed sense of optimism in the neighborhood. In 1991, the Red Pagoda roof went up over the Argyle Street CTA Red Line platform. Mayor Richard M. Daly called Charlie Sue, who died in 2001, quote, a tireless community advocate who worked hard to ensure that Asian Americans were recognized for their work. During the recent expansion of the red line, the pagoda over the Argyle stop has been temporarily taken down, as has the Asia on Argyle sign underneath it. Now then, back to Erica Allen Kim and her book, Building Little Saigon, which looks back at nearly 50 years of refugee urbanism and the lessons still to be learned from conflicts entangled in colonialist legacies. First up, I wanted to know how Erica Allen Kim describes herself. I describe myself primarily as a historian of vernacular architecture, and the easiest way to understand that is I don't study architecture with a capital A. So if it's like, you know, Frank Gehry, Liebeskin building, that's probably not something I'm interested in. I'm interested in the history and the use of everyday buildings. So buildings that you would walk by and not even give a second glance, but I'm super curious about how it came to be, why it looks the way it does and how it's changed over the years. And so I mostly walk around cities and I bring my students to different neighborhoods and we try to decipher the built landscape. And we do a lot of archival research we talk to people, we dig through tax assessment roles, we look at everything, um, city plans, and we try to construct a, a history of these landscapes. As she grew up in Southern California and now lives in Canada, I was curious as to when this love of architecture really took hold of her. So I started my, my career probably as a 15-year-old. Um, I was interested in art history. And I'd always been a bit nerdy. And I remember in my AP art history class in high school, we started to study Gothic cathedrals, which was about as foreign as you can imagine for a kid growing up in a post-war suburban city of Long Beach. And I started to understand that the buildings themselves were works of art. And I was interested in how the materials and the symbols, the stained glass, all of these things were communicating important values of that community, not only to themselves, but also 
to posterity. And so I started to look at architecture differently, not just something that, you know, you're just zipping into a mall or you're you're going to a museum, but actually thinking more critically about those buildings. And so I started to uh, transition to studying more architecture uh, in college. I went to Pomona College and then in my graduate studies, I focused almost entirely on architecture and urban design history because I'm really interested in the city politics and the economics of how these things are built, as well as the artistry. The big question I ask of anyone who dives into a project like this, what prompted you to take this on? So this is all of my graduate research. So I began this research. I know this is probably very daunting to anyone interested in academia, but I began the research in 2005 when I was a graduate student. I did most of the traveling and research over the next four or five years. Um, When I had the luxury of time, I didn't have small children, I didn't have teaching duties, I was able to do this. The reason why I became so passionate about Little Saigons was that I grew up in Long Beach. My parents are Korean immigrants. And we grew up in this sort of very cookie cutter kind of suburban landscape. And I spent most of my weekends in sort of a smaller Korea town. So not the big one in Los Angeles, but a smaller one in Orange County. And right on the other side of the freeway was Little Saigon. And not only was it a little, little Saigon, it was the biggest Little Saigon in the world. And so I always was curious about, you know, these two Asian communities that kind of coexist side by side, but you didn't see a lot of overlap. And so I was interested in why the Little Saigon had developed to be so big um, and so prominent as it was. And so it then raised the question, are all the Little Saigons like this? And doing research in 2005 was a bit different (laughs) than if I started this research today, I think it would be easier in a lot of ways, especially because so many uh, Vietnamese Americans who are about my age or a little bit younger have really come of age and they are telling their own stories and they're doing their own advocacy and their own archiving of family histories and the communities and they're really advocating for these ethnic enclaves, their, their future. And so there's a lot of material that's now available for anyone who wants to do this research. But when I was doing this research, in 2005, it was a lot harder to access those sources. Um, The community mindset was a little bit different. They were much more focused on, you know, just daily survival, right? Like you're just busy, you're working, you don't really want to be bothered. But I thought it was really important to go to those communities at that moment and start to look at some changes that were afoot because you could start to see some development happening. And I wanted to understand that sort of moment of transition. And there really hadn't been a comprehensive history of Little Saigons in the world, but also in the United States. And so I thought it was important to go and visit the largest ones I could find. And it was a choice I made. Um, There was a moment where I wanted to just go everywhere, but obviously there are budgetary um, constraints. There's some really interesting Vietnamese American communities in New Orleans, for example. So, you know, you have to sort of make some choices, but I was mostly focused on shopping centers and restaurants and commercial street fronts and things like that, because that's the most sort of public facing part of the community. That's where people from outside of the community are more likely to come, to visit, to shop, to eat, to talk to people. Generally, you wouldn't go to a temple, you wouldn't go to a church, you wouldn't go inside someone's home. So I think the commercial cultural life of these these communities is incredibly important. And they're so fleeting because, again, people are just, they're busy working. And so I thought, why not go and visit all of these places and talk to people and access the local public history, the public libraries are are basically a godsend. I will say when you have communities that are not really valued by sort of the mainstream kind of repositories of knowledge, like the archives, for whatever reason, then 
generally you'll have to either go and talk to people, which is very daunting, or you also go to the public library, which tends to um, do newspaper clippings or microfilm, microfiche, you know, and sometimes they have donated papers. Even today, I think it would be difficult to access some of the materials that I was able to access because you actually have to go to these places. And this is something I often remind my students who are so eager to do everything online, including Google Street View to look at a building, but you don't actually go to the building. Only like things that are digitized is just that's just a fraction of what exists. And it's and you have to ask, well, why was that digitized and why were other things not digitized? And so, you know, thank God for public libraries and local history museums and all of these, you know, tireless people who are librarians and archivists who are collecting the material, as well as enthusiasts, right? Local historian enthusiasts who are taking photographs, writing blogs, publishing things like they're incredibly invaluable. But um, I was lucky enough to get a few travel grants. I was able to even spend a month in Vietnam and I was able to talk to some urban planners out there as well, just trying to understand, you know, what is that relationship between Vietnam and these little Saigon communities? I was really interested in talking to younger people in little Saigons, as well as sort of the, the old guard, the, old, the long timers, just to get a sense of the generational shift, because you can you could even feel it in 2005. You could see how the, the first generation there nearing retirement. And you could see that there was some uncertainty about what would happen to these enclaves as they begin to retire, as they begin to close up their businesses, whether the next generation would take on those businesses or they would move on to something else. And I think that's a very, you know, it's also a very American story, um, which is really built on immigration and this sort of promise of social mobility, this idea that you will not take on the family business, you will go on to bigger, brighter, better things, unless, you know, it's like this nepotistic thing, like <laughs> your parents are actors and you become an actor. But in general, you know, you want to sort of, you want your children to move forward. And so we value these ethnic enclaves and these shopping centers and these restaurants and shops so much. But often they're really fleeting. They may only last a generation at most, sometimes not even a generation. And so I thought it was really important to go as quickly as possible and try to document as much as I could, because I knew even within 10, 15 years, these neighborhoods would change quite a bit. And even Argyle Street has changed quite a lot. One thing about which I'm often curious is what outsiders thought of Chicago growing up compared to when they finally visited the greatest city in the world, and pose that question to my guest. <laughs> that's a, that's a funny question. So, growing up in California, I think we had I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. This idea that we didn't really have much of a history, or it was you know everything seemed pretty new, you know. And of course, you start peeling back the layers and you start to understand the complicated history of California and Western settlement and a lot of the, the wars that happened, um, the colonialism. And so there is a lot of history there, obviously. But I would always think about the rest of the United States, particularly the eastern half, as having so much history and having these beautiful buildings with all this decoration and these tall skyscrapers and, you know, really dense urban fabric. And so my imagination of, of Chicago really, I think, was shaped by television and movies. Um, just thinking about what it could be like to live in a city where, you know, it's sometimes there's just so much shadow because of the tall buildings. That was something that seemed very foreign to me. And the first time I went to Chicago, I was actually already quite old, to be honest. I was in graduate studies and a friend of mine, we decided for spring break. I think it was our first year of graduate school. We were in, we were at Harvard and uh, she said, let's go to Chicago just as a lark. Let's just go for a few days. And so we went and to me, it was probably the most exciting moment to go to a city that had all of the great examples of modern architecture 
in the United States. I'd already spent a lot of time in, you know, San Francisco and Seattle and New York and Boston, obviously, but there's something about flying into Chicago, seeing all those layers of modern architecture history, looking at the river, looking at all the bridge systems, like the lake, everything, having studied it so much, to actually walk around and experience it, I think was incredibly powerful, but it wasn't the part of Chicago that I then began to focus on in my studies, which is interesting. Like I was really interested in the loop more as a tourist and architectural historian. And then by exploring all of the different little neighborhoods outside of the loop, that's where I became more interested in the social history and the diversity of Chicago. This made me wonder if Erica Allen Kim had a Chicago building that was even more breathtaking in person for her. I know this sounds so trite, but the the Marina City Towers, <laughs> there's something about that. They were just so beautiful to me. I wasn't, I'm really a fan of sort of like the 50s and 60s, more whimsical architecture. Obviously, Mies van der Rohe and Frank Lloyd Wright, like fantastic work, but there's something so Um, whimsical about the Marina City Towers that I just thought how weird that these buildings could be built. They look almost like some anime cartoon characters. And to be in such a serious city like Chicago, you know, which is really was built on finance, right? On capital and trading, commerce, thinking about the cattle and like the the meatpacking industry. And then later on, you know, it's more high tech. But then you have these like buildings that look like corn on the cob or little flowers. I thought, I like that there's whimsy. I, I like that there's some um, some playfulness to Chicago uh, on top of all the, you know, really amazing modern architecture, uh, which, you know, it's basically a textbook on modern architecture if you want to you want to study it. So I got to ask, what were some of the biggest surprises you found while researching this book? So a couple things. One, I was surprised by certain kinds of spaces, sort of the way that certain shops were used or subdivided. I found it was surprising to see a consistency across these little Saigons that you would go into the sort of nondescript strip mall. It looks just like a strip mall, but then there was a little door that would say mall entrance. And you're like, this isn't a mall. This is obviously... It's like an L-shaped shopping center, like a, you know, a little neighborhood shopping center with, you know, a parking lot. But indeed, there was there were shops inside that could only be accessed from inside. And I thought that is such a weird thing. And so I started to see this kind of interiorization of these commercial spaces where it has certain advantages, financial advantages. You can imagine that if you double the number of shops, then they, they they will be more affordable. More people can start little businesses, especially for immigrant communities. But this particular model of this like really dense market is very Vietnamese. It comes directly from what people remembered as a commercial practice in Vietnam. And so you will see, I would see that again and again and again, and that really differentiated the Vietnamese from all the other kind of ethnic communities. So that was surprising. Um, The thing that was also surprising was just how locally specific each little Saigon was, that it was hard to make these kind of clear generalizations because each one really depended on the local ecosystem of, I basically it's politics and money and culture, right? So the same formula of success for an ethnic enclave doesn't work in one town versus the next town. And I thought that was really important. So I spent a bit of time comparing, contrasting two very suburban places, Houston and Westminster, Orange County, California. And you would think they would have sort of similar outcomes, but in the end, they didn't. And I also found with Argyle Street, you know, it is a very small little Saigon, but I felt In the end, it felt very Chicago. Like there's something about the way West Argyle Street, the Heritage District, and then Asia and Argyle have developed that feels also, to me, it can only really be understood. And if I had more time, I would say more about kind of the 
bigger landscape of ethnic lands, like ethnic communities in Chicago. Because once you think about Chicago at, at, at large, then you understand what's special or similar about Asia and Argyle compared to these other kind of far-flung ethnic communities. You write in your book that local journalists identified Argyle Street as Little Saigon as early as 1986, but there were some that insisted on referring to it as New Chinatown. Please share with me your feelings on that. I don't know if I have feelings, but one thing I will say, you know, is that the branding of a neighborhood is very fraught with rivalries, um, different sort of intentions about who owns the space. And so even like calling it the West Argyle Street Heritage District, that's sort of one official moniker right now. And the other official moniker, which is I think about 13 years old now is Asia and Argyle. It was sort of like a rebranding of this area. And those two terms, I don't know about you, but they really give me the sense of it's a bit generic, right? It's like West Argyle Street. Like, I don't even, it's like very geographically specific, but it doesn't really give you a flavor of the neighborhood. And then Asia on Argyle suggests the sort of pan-Asian identity. So you're not really sure what you're going to get, but you know it's kind of loosely under the umbrella of Asian. And this kind of figuring out of what the identity of this neighborhood is has, has been going on since the 60s. And it's super interesting because Argyle Street, sort of the Argyle District in the 1960s, was cre- it was sort of settled by um, the Hip Sing Association as this rival Chinatown. Because you have to think about the historic Chinatown sort of centered around uh, Cermak Station, it had pretty limited growth potential. There is a lot of sort of infrastructural limits to how it can grow. It's kind of really hemmed in. And so they decided this rival association, because there's the On Leong Association, was sort of mostly in, I wouldn't say in power, but, you know, they spoke for well, we can we could say that, I guess, you know, these these smaller um, organizations. So the hip scene decided to buy some buildings up in Argyle, which is only about, I think it's like 17 stops north on the red line. So no transfers, super easy, right? Everyone can remember how to get there. Um, transit is really important. I think when you think Chicago, you always think about the different transit lines and the stops and like how many transfers, things like that. So they purchased some properties and they started this pretty, you know, aggressive campaign to rebrand it as a new Chinatown. They wanted to build like little pagodas and moon gates and little, you know, gardens and things, little plazas and really theme it in the 60s. And that kind of continued through the 90s, even as Argyle Street became settled by Southeast Asian refugees, some of whom are ethnic Chinese, but many who are not, right? And so there started to be some conflict where, you know, Chinatown as a brand is incredibly powerful. Everyone in the United States knows more or less, they have an idea of what a Chinatown is. Little Saigon is is more, you know, it's sort of an unknown entity. And so as a, a branding exercise, there is a reason why Chinatown seems, you know, like a safer bet, especially in the newspaper. You know, you're saying, oh, we're, we're having our lunar uh, parade, New Year parade, um, and it's starting at the Hip Sing Association building in New Chinatown or Chinatown North, you know. And then some average person who's just sort of reading the newspaper will go, oh, that's interesting. I can have some dim sum. I can see some line dances like that's the brandy. But then you go to Argyle and you walk around and, you know, Joseph Hurdle, who founded the Vietnam War Museum in the 80s, he said he would walk up there and it felt like he was back in Vietnam. He was a veteran. So this was not Chinatown. So people who once kind of uh, entered that space, the name Chinatown did not mesh with their experience of that space and, and the shops and the signage, the language the cuisine, 
the scent of all the food, the, the herbs, everything was more evocative of Southeast Asia. And so there started to be some competition where you had, you know, New Chinatown, an Asian village, which I, I noted um, in my book sounds very generic, but if you are in the know as a Vietnamese American, you would know that Asian Village is the name of one of the biggest malls in Little Saigon in Westminster, California. So these Little Saigons all know each other. They have their own kind of like um, ecosystem. They, they understand sort of, and they will start to reproduce the same names. And so you start to see these banners up and down Argyle Street, some of them say New Chinatown, some of them say Asian Village. And there's this like competition. And if you actually look up and see them, you realize that some of them are quite old and they were never taken down and some of them are newer. And so you see this layering of all these different branding exercises. And the same goes for the Pagoda Gate, which is on the Argyle station platform. That was done as sort of to support this kind of pan-Asian or Chinatown, new Chinatown identity. But at the same time, and I was talking to another person the, of the Vietnamese um, American Association, they, he, he was talking about how there's actually some controversy where some Vietnamese Americans wanted to establish what they called a freedom gate, which is obviously very political, right? And so even thinking about a pagoda gate or, a China, or an arch, sometimes we call it a Chinatown arch, but an arch seems so neutral for an outsider you don't really read the politics and you don't read the rivalries and you don't read this kind of like territorialization that's happening you're just going there for dim sum or you're going there for a banh mi and you're not really thinking about how important this space is for these different communities and so when you kind of enter these spaces i think it's it's important to ask some of those questions and to just carefully observe the signage, to carefully observe the flags that are sometimes flown. Sometimes those will indicate different uh, political affiliations that, you know, we call them homeland politics. So if you're an immigrant, you might be really invested in the politics of home. And this is sort of your new home, but you're also interested in what's happening back in the homeland. You know, so you start to see all of these layers and a lot of diversity that can't really, you know, Asia and Argyle, I think, is probably the most generic <laughs> moniker you can find. But, you know, Seattle has the International District, which is even more generic, I would say. But Chinatown, I think, and my research sort of revealed this, is also very problematic right? Because it can kind of hide a lot of that diversity as well. And people will start to forget that it is in fact always changing. And a lot of Chinatowns are incredibly diverse. Either it's more mainland Chinese uh, immigration or a lot of them like um, Boston and Los Angeles are incredibly Vietnamese, for example. So you go to what is Chinatown officially and you realize that most of the shops are Vietnamese. And then you have to ask yourself, well, why is that? And then there's the added layer that within Vietnam, you have a lot of different ethnic groups, but the two largest being you have the ethnic Chinese and you have Vietnamese. And even within the Vietnamese, there are different groups. And so even within that, you have a lot of diversity and sometimes some rivalry and conflict as well. So I would say look at those signs and pay attention to all those different like regional changes that you would see even in the cuisine. You mentioned Joe Hurdle, a Vietnam vet who ran the Vietnam War Museum from 1984 to 2000. What effect do you think his museum's lack of support from the city and eventual demise has had on the Vietnamese population and Vietnam vets in Chicago? In some ways, it's very sad to think about the sort of one man show, you know, he sort of single handedly brought together American veterans as well as South Vietnamese veterans who are both kind of arriving in Chicago at the same time and feeling very uncomfortable about what their place is in Chicago in the United States. You know, it's a very kind of difficult period. And he created this little storefront museum. It had many different locations. And it was kind of like a community center 
you know, people could donate artifacts, souvenirs, they could go and they could just sort of sit quietly, they could grieve, they could sort of process their trauma. It became a place where people could drop off um, different things that could be then distributed to people in need across Chicagoland. He also um, sponsored English language classes. Like it was a really, it was sort of a hub that kind of connected these two communities for about 20 years. And there was this moment, I think it was a real shoestring budget kind of operation. There was this moment where I think he just couldn't do it anymore. He was getting older. Um, his son tragically drowned. You know, there are a lot of different things happening in his life. And so, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that the museum shuttered and then it sort of lived on in a website for a while. And then that also shuttered because we all know someone needs to maintain um, the website. But I think in terms of the loss for both communities, it's difficult to gauge because I think you have the Veterans Art Museum in Chicago, which sort of emerged around the same time. Obviously you've got the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in DC where they also collect artifacts. Um, and now Vietnamese Americans are starting to build their own archives, their own sort of collections of different kinds of material and sort of curating it for themselves. I think probably what would be the nicest outcome for the museum and all the artifacts is to have it kind of redistributed, right? So that the material and the stories and even how he sort of came to create this museum could then be sort of folded into these newer collections so that it isn't just this like forgotten chapter. And I think that's probably the most important thing because for me, it's just looking at all of the other little Saigons, I would say Joe's work was unique across all of the Vietnamese American communities and that he really embedded himself in the little Saigon on Argyle Street. And a lot of American veterans, surprise, surprise, um, stayed in touch with uh, Vietnamese uh, generally Vietnamese who were working, um, they were sort of attaches, they were working with the American government, the military, and so they had these, these contacts. And so they, they stayed in touch once they arrived in the United States. And sometimes they even built up business partnerships, and we see that in some of the, the little Saigons. But there's also a lot of friction between the two communities, a lot of resentment, a lot of anger, a lot of finger pointing sometimes happens. It's still it's still there. Um, and he sort of created this really beautiful kind of bridging moment for the community where it was an opportunity for them to connect with each other in in a way that was not about making money. It was not about rivalry. It was just about kind of supporting each other. And I thought that was really unusual um, compared to a lot of the other little Saigons where, you know, there tends to be a bit more separation between the two communities. And so it was really important for me to tell that story as well and to kind of map its trajectory um, through, through the Chicago geography as well, the landscape. Although you don't live in Chicago, I'm sure you have thoughts about ways Little Saigon could be improved here and really everywhere. How might city and neighborhood officials make this area more welcoming to all while maintaining its cultural identity? That's a great question. So there are actually quite a few people in the Asia and Argyle community um, that have started to build out that capacity themselves. There's one group called Celebrate Argyle. It sort of emerged during the pandemic to sort of highlight different businesses. And they've been able to sort of have this social media presence and to do little pop-up events to also, you know, encourage people to explore Asia and Argyle, the different shops, the new ones, as well as the old ones. They have not received a lot of funding to sort of support those initiatives. And so, you know, if I were in city politics, you know, I would try to build out some of those grants, you know, to really encourage not only the painting of murals, which I think is really beautiful, but actual economic assistance and technological assistance to really, you know, make sure that these businesses 
are visible. If I were a local journalist, I would probably write a lot about these spaces and do sort of human centered stories that are also really appealing for kind of the average, I would say, local tourist who's just kind of interested in going uptown to maybe get a little bowl of pho or like whatever they're doing. So those are things that I think are really important. They also have the Argyle Night Market, and it runs almost every every weekend in the summer. And so I think that has been an amazing initiative. I think more and more we're starting to see night markets pop up in the most unexpected places like suburban uh, shopping malls in the parking lot, as well as more kind of urban neighborhoods. And so I think that's a model of outreach that is really important. And I think if you can make it a bit more sort of locally specific, so it doesn't feel like just some, you know, concession stand type of street festival, but like really bring in some of the cultural community organizations to showcase what they're doing, you know, whether it's music, dance, drumming, you know, different arts practices, cooking, things like that. I think those are really important, but I would say a lot of it is money, you know, which I know is, is not an, it's not an easy solution, but I think giving more grants, I think is really important and hopefully also offering loans and some kind of economic opportunity for the new generation, the upcoming generation, so that like the, uh, the children of the, the farmers, maybe they do want to go and do some farming, but maybe they want to do it their way, right? So maybe they're doing a lot of organic farming or this kind of farming or whatever. So maybe, you know, you want to have your dim sum, but slightly different. If the city can provide that kind of funding, I think that's incredibly powerful in terms of just the the survival of these communities. Would you prefer they not put the pagoda back up over the CTA line? And if you were asked to name the area, what would that name be? Those are impossible questions. So the easier one is, yes, I think the pagoda should go back up. (laughs) It's a complicated object, but I think there's a lot of genuine affection for it. And it's a real, it's really unique. I can actually only think of two transit stations that have a pagoda roof. I think the other one is in Los Angeles' Chinatown. So it is pretty special. It's pretty unique. So I would say bring it back. That terrible font, obviously, they need to rethink their graphic design. Branding-wise, honestly, I don't know because to call it Little Saigon is a very kind of specific choice. I think Asia on Argyle is a mouthful. So maybe sticking with the Pan-Asian could be okay, but I don't know how important it is to call it Argyle. I really like Chinatown North and and New Chinatown back in the 60s and 70s. Obviously, it doesn't make sense now, but they, they kind of rolled off the tongue more. But I don't know. Naming a district is hard. Or you just call it Argyle, you know? That's the interesting thing is that if you're within the community, you usually don't call it Koreatown or Little Saigon. So Little Saigon is often just called Bolsa, which is the main street. And even for me, we called it Garden Grove, which was the main Garden Grove Boulevard. We didn't call it Koreatown. So there's some interesting things about the names that we choose and and the affection we have, but... I think there's every time there's a, a name change, there's a lot of um, controversy. The fact that they have Asia and Argyle, it may have to stay as well. It's unclear, but I don't know. It also depends on what's what's changing in the neighborhood. I would say ask the community members what they think it should be called, and they can vote on it or they can generate their own name. But I think it would be a bit of hubris for me to to select a name for a community that. <laughs> But I love the names that are just, it's like Pilsen. You're like, what is Pilsen? And then you start to dig into the history and then you realize how complicated and wonderful it is. So, and that's what I love about Chicago. It's kind of like the street names remain and the communities keep changing. For listeners looking to experience their local Little Saigon, what do you suggest they do to best take in the area? 
look at the menu and and you know everyone has their phone everyone can translate things everyone can look up what a dish is try to find the most sort of regionally specific cuisines and dishes and just give them a try because that's probably you know i think where you'll get really interesting variations uh on these cuisines and so yeah don't just go for like the usual suspects try to stretch your palate a little bit and also just spend time just sit around and observe how people move through the space you know look at who's coming and going into these shops and you'll start to get a sense of the life of the community um not just on the weekends when they're tourists but just you know even on a weekday go go for lunch and just you'll see like a whole lineup of people who are waiting to buy baguettes <laughs> which is like always this and you just have the smell of of baking bread is just so wonderful and it makes you start to think about why are there so many baguettes in Vietnamese cuisine maybe it has something to do with french colonialism and so you start to really connect the dots of world history and how it's playing out on a very local stage on June 3rd, 2010, the area roughly bounded by Broadway to the west, Winona Street to the north, Sheridan Road to the east, and Ainsley Street to the south was entered into the National Register of Historic Places. to my guest, Erica Allen Kim, for sharing her knowledge and insights, and thanks to Elizabeth Winkler at UT Press for helping put this together. In addition to being an architectural historian, Allen Kim is a slow fashion guru who you can and should follow on Instagram at A History of Architecture. If you have questions about anything covered today, Anything to add or have a different topic you think might be a good fit for a future episode of the Chicago History Podcast, please send me an email at chicagohistorypod at gmail.com. Thanks as always to John K. Schneider for creating the Chicago History Podcast logo and the art used on the social media pages. He can be found via email at angeleyesartjks at gmail.com. Take a moment this week to tell a friend about the Chicago History Podcast. We would love to reach new listeners and fans of Chicago history. Get out and explore when possible. If you're in Chicago, take a trip to Argyle Street. Learn more about whatever city you live in and stay safe.